Great. Um, so um, as I mentioned, my name is Maureen Brondike. I'm the executive director at New City Arts. Um, if you don't know us, we're an arts organization that runs a number of community programs in Charlottesville, including a space called Welcome Gallery downtown where tonight's exhibition, um, the exhibition we're talking about tonight is on view through Thursday. So if you wanna come by Wednesday or Thursday between noon and six this week, those are your last two days to see the show. Um, I'm gonna drop, after, after I do the introduction, I'll put a link in the chat um, with more information about, about how to see, see the exhibition, including our address. Um, this exhibition, sit Situated Knowledge, brings together three artists who are invited by New City Arts to make works connected to monuments. These artists have spent formative years in Charlottesville and have a shared interest in local, embodied, and situated knowledge. The exhibit features work by Patrick Costello, who's here tonight, um, who earned a BA in printmaking from UVA in, tw in 2008. Marisa Williamson, who was UVA's Rough and Distinguished Artist in Residence in 2018 and returned this year as an assistant professor of visual art with a research focus on blackness. And Sandy Williams, who earned a BFA from UVA in 2016. Um, I wanted to read a bit of the exhibition statement that was written by Marisa Williamson. Um, and to give you a little bit more context, which Patrick will share tonight, we invited each of these artists to participate in the show um, and to create works that were connected to previous works they had made that were much larger than any work that could fit in the gallery. Um, and when we invited the artists to come together and commission them to make these works, they um, created works that uh, spoke to one another and were Charlottesville specific and also could fit inside the gallery doors. Um, so Marisa wrote a, a longer artist statement that I'll share um, or exhibition statement that I'll share, but here's just a, a quick um, few sentences about the show as a whole. Um, these artists experiment with gestures that remediate erasure, taking into account the unaccounted for. They engage in a certain type of feminist archeology, span a practice of dismantling that which was designed to hide and to obscure. At the same time, the works cannot hide the struggle. Our problem, to summarize Donna Haraway's thesis in Situated Knowledges, the science question in feminism and the privilege of partial perspective is how to have simultaneously a traumatic knowledge of painful legacies and at the same time not be defined, disillusioned and dismantled by that knowledge. Um, this exhibition is presented by the fund at CACF and sponsored by Lisa M. Drain. And I just wanna um, thank them for their support. Um, they provided the funding for the commissions for each artist in the exhibition. Um, so let's dive in. I'm gonna introduce Patrick and then Federico and then hand it off to them. Um, Patrick Costello is an interdisciplinary artist and ecological horticulturist who makes work arising from specific relationships, histories, and ecosystems. His work spans the disciplines of drawing, sculpture, gardening, and theater. Patrick completed his MFA in combined media at Hunter College in 2018. Patrick's work has been exhibited at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, 601 Art Space in New York, Second Street Gallery in Charlottesville and Socrates Sculpture Park in Queens, as well as independent and alternative spaces nationally and abroad, including Cinema Blosh in Brooklyn, Space 1026 in Philadelphia and Transpop in Tokyo. He's performed in venues, including Ars Nova in New York, the Philadelphia Museum of Art in Philadelphia, Space Gallery in Portland. Patrick has held residencies with New City Arts in Charlottesville. He's our first resident artist back in 2011. Um, Acre in Chicago and Hewn Oaks Artist Colony in Lovell. Patrick, um, up until very recently, was living and working in a seven person collective house in Brooklyn where he maintained a small wildflower meadow on the roof. Um, born in Cholula, Pebla, Mexico, Federico Cuadalacuat is an artist based in Virginia and an assistant professor in the Department of Art at the University of Virginia. Federico's work is invested in disseminating topics of Latinx immigration, social art practice, and cultural sustainability. Building from his own experience growing up as an undocumented immigrant and previously holding DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, Federico's creative practice centers on the intersectionality of indigeneity and immigration under a pressing Anthropocene, transborder indigeneity, and migrant indigenous futurisms. Thank you both for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick, who's gonna share with us for a bit, and then him and Federico will be in conversation together. Thank you, Maureen. <clears throat> and hello, everyone. So many people that I know and love. Um, I am so excited to be here tonight talking with Federico. Thank you, Maureen and New City Arts and uh, Lisa Drain and everyone who made this possible, um, this event, but also this show. 
Um, I'm, I feel very honored to be a part of it. Um, I'm gonna share my screen really quick. Um, if I can figure out how to do that. There we go. It's happening. And then now I have to figure out how to use Google. Google presentation. We got to present. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, many folks from Charlottesville may remember my fifth year fellowship installation at UVA or my shows at the garage from a decade ago. Some of you may have seen the collaborative installation Kate Dodrell and I exhibited at Second Street Gallery. And for those shows, I was making prints and displaying color spectrums of canned food from my garden or from Kate's urban farm in Detroit. I was growing plants and gallery spaces, hanging them from the ceiling. And, oops, that was not, let's see, there we go. Um, hanging them from the ceiling, trying to create a space for people to rethink their relationship to soil and food, to build communities or at least conversations around these things. Around, the, around that same time, I co-founded Seville Foodscapes, a worker-owned cooperative business in Charlottesville, helping people grow food at their homes. The business wasn't an art project, but it was an early experiment in trying to support myself while actively practicing an alternative way of inhabiting the world. In 2012, I left Charlottesville, the closest thing to a hometown I've ever had and spent three years collaboratively making, performing, and touring theater with theater projects. I mostly worked with Donna Oblongata during this time, whose writing and performance-based work spans many disciplines and often creates space for alternative ways of interacting and creating value. Together, Donna and I helped each other realize ambitious creative projects that actively experimented with how people, including us, might relate, participate, and find meaning in unexpected places. It was Donna who introduced me to, oh, it's doing the thing again. These are some pictures from a production, an illegal production of Les Miserables that Donna directed and conceived that 60 people showed up to the woods of Vermont and we built for a month. Um, and then we took it on tour down the East Coast. There's little old me being a star. There's me dressed as a mushroom. Um, it was Donna who introduced me to Jill Dolan's idea of utopian performatives, which forms a critical basis for most things that I make. Um, utopian performatives lift everyone slightly above the present into a hopeful feeling of what the world might be like if every moment of our lives were as emotionally voluminous, generous, aesthetically striking, and intersubjectively intense. They persuade us that beyond this now of material oppression and unequal power relations lives a future that might be different, one whose potential we can feel as we're seared by the promise of a present that gestures, gestures towards a better later. I love, I love that. Um, oh, oh. I don't know why. There we go. Um, I love that quote, and I uh, think that idea is really central to many, in, in many ways, to different things that I make. Um, in 2015, I moved to New York and went to Hunter College for graduate school, where I continued to make performances and installations, mining my own story and identity, often towards collaborative ends. With the help of my friend Travis Seahorn, I revived my country music gymnast persona, PJ Idaho, which I had first developed when I was nine. And PJ became a way of contending with American conceptions of masculinity. Travis was my backup band and my horse. You can see I'm riding him over the Purple Mountains uh, majesty in this image. Um, then with assistance from my friends Mitchell Dose and Jesse Lee, 
I made a choir room in a gallery, co-wrote a choral song with composer Emily Bate, and then co-taught that song to small groups of participants who formed impromptu choirs and performed the piece only for one another inside the room. It was a piece about physical presence, about being game to try a thing and take a risk, about lots of different voices. I think that through creative projects, I aim to situate my body or myself in relation to other selves, to see how my skill sets and interests and perspectives interact with other people's ideas and stories and feelings, to try things out in relation to US history, in relation to my gender and sexuality, in relation to public space, in relation to my decade of experience as an ecological horticulturist, in relation to my love of group singing. I put this quote by Donna Haraway in here because it also is another time that she mentions, mentions situated knowledges, um, uh, which is uh, the title of the show that we're all here um, about. Uh, we do not seek partiality for its own sake, but for the sake of connections and unexpected openings that situated knowledges make possible. The only way to find a larger vision is to be somewhere in particular. I think about that a lot when I'm making things as well, um, because I, I want to kind of revel in the fact that uh, my perspective is so limited. Um, it's limited by history. It's limited by this, the scale of my body in relation to everything else. It's, it's, um, it's partial and therefore it means that I get to operate from somewhere in particular, like, like Haraway was saying. Um, and I think there's some real power in that, um, or at least something exciting about that. So, uh, Kind of switching gears a little bit, I was cat sitting in New York City's Far Rockaways during the lethal events of A12 in 2017. But that awful day shifted my own sense of who I was and where I was from. And after that day, I couldn't stop thinking about the Robert E. Lee sculpture in Charlottesville and about the space inside the orange construction fencing, which had been put up to protect the sculpture and its surrounding gardens in the aftermath. This is an aerial image of Seeding Ground, which was a piece commissioned by Socrates Sculpture Park in Queens. Uh, I began with a question. What might my personal partial perspective add to a conversation about the removal of monuments, especially when those monuments depict people who look like me? Uh, I thought about how monuments in the US reinforce power structures and uphold many long held formal conventions too from their bronze sculptures to the designed landscapes that surround their pedestals. And as a gardener, I looked at those cultivated spaces and I couldn't help but imagine what they might hold instead of the manicured neoclassical designs that we're used to seeing. Charlottesville's Lee Monument is flanked by formal gardens of, or was flanked, was, very much was, flanked by formal gardens of English boxwoods, Japanese hollies, and peonies. All of these plants were initially only found overseas and then introduced to this continent as a direct result of colonial economies. My installation in Queens echoed and replaced the dimensions of Charlottesville's fenced-in territory in an effort to transform that contested space. I removed both the perimeter fence and the statue at its center, leaving garden beds surrounding an unoccupied rectangle of bare earth. Making that central void accessible invited viewers to come in and repopulate the position of the erstwhile statue, shifting one's perspective from gazing up at a bronze fig figure to looking out and around and down at the ground. My installation in Queens, uh, oh, I already said that part. I'm, I'm reading from a paper. Uh, okay, Seeding Ground references the historical ecologies of its specific site. 
overflowing with a collection of flora that grew, grew within a hundred miles of what is now Socrates Sculpture Park for generations prior to the initial arrival of my European ancestors here. So these are some of the species included in that garden. Um, it was when we first installed it, it was so lush because it was the, it was like high summer. Um, and then the piece was installed for six months and tending that garden in New York City where I've lived for a long time now provided me with a regular physical practice that helped reconcile the spiritual distance between where I'm from, Charlottesville, and where I currently reside. The plant species I included in the piece remind me of a time before white supremacy sculpted our collective consciousness and our expect expectations of public space. I mean, I wasn't around for that time period, but these plants hold within them, uh, like within their very existence, um, a reminder of that time. They predate white supremacy and indeed continue to thrive without any regard for our human made systems. They persist even as people label them as weeds and smother them with lawns, parking lots, and buildings. Seeding ground provided wisdom in its seasonally shifting form. It removed a terrible sculpture of a dead racist and took space back for other living things. The plants grow, bloom, and go dormant. The bugs make their homes there, eat, and in turn pollinate the flowers. Wind, sun, rain, snow, park visitors, birds, powdery mildew, all of these things affect the garden's form with only minimal presence of my hand. The piece is a space filled with actions and attempts, partiality. It functions much like a utopian performative, hinting at dynamics that may help reshape our presence within potential landscapes to come. Uh, this is right at the right before we deinstalled the piece and dispersed it to its new homes, um, of which there are several. Um, and it was in the springtime, and the grasses were just starting to come back. Those grasses uh, grasses eventually got like four or five feet tall this this season alone. Um, but it was just exciting to see the little tufts of them as we were deinstalling. Um, so that's another image of the piece. I like this picture because there's that little person with their little bike. Um, okay, so I wanted to bring in another quote that, that seems relevant to the conversation we're uh, having here or that these pieces might create. Um, History as nearly no one seems to know is not merely something to be read and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. And that is from James Baldwin. Um, a hero for us all. Uh, so this, this is the piece I made for this show at Welcome Gallery. Um, I'm calling it Seeding Ground 2, and uh, I see it as a kind of companion piece to the Queen's installation um, that we just looked at. Um, and with Seeding Ground 2, I recreated Thomas Jefferson's iconic serpentine walls out of cob, um, which is a mixture of straw, sand, and clay, embedded with a meadow seed mix native to central Virginia. Um, one of the seed mixes, I, I actually worked with a company that um, Ernst Seeds that sources its seeds from the kind of uh, bioregion that central Virginia is a part of. And the seed mix is actually called Virginia Gentleman's Seed Mix, which um, is a weird, uh, a weird name. Um, these walls at the University of Virginia originally concealed the labor of enslaved people working at UVA. And they are also a celebrated symbol of the university's grounds. 
So gallery visitors were encouraged to take the wall apart. Uh, that's me putting it together, but um, I think I have a picture of somebody taking it apart. Oh, maybe I don't. Um, um, well, you can imagine that when people came in, they started taking bricks home with them. And uh, maybe you even were one of the people who took a brick home or maybe 25 or 50 or even 100. Um, there were 528 in total and there are very few left now, thanks to Maureen and a bunch of different community members who came together to take this wall apart. So thank you for that. Um, but the idea is that we would take it apart brick by brick and that people would bring those bricks home with them and plant them, transforming this piece of, of contentious architecture into a functioning part of an ecosystem. Um, because you would take the brick, you plant it, and then ideally in the spring, those, those seeds will overwinter and then come up in the spring as a, a, a little chunk of meadow um, with, with plants native to the area. Um, I was excited with this piece to explore an idea of like composting racist structures or figuring out what might um, happen as, uh, as a piece made by a white person in a gallery disappears from a gallery or what might happen when um, we actively dismantle something and the energy of that thing dis disperses and then participates in new ecological systems. And yeah, so I just think uh, that that's where I, that's where I want to leave it and then start talking to Federico, um, who I'm, who I have spoken with once before and was so, um, uh, I was so excited about that because he's so cool. Um, yeah, so. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, that was, uh, that was really great to see you go over previous works and just, I mean, it, it's always super helpful to hear artists talk about their work and how you're kind of navigating and continuing to to develop this kind of thought process around your, your process and and the way that you're um, you're inviting people. I think that to me really stands out as this kind of beautiful aura around your work. Um, even from your earlier works, there seems to be this kind of like constant reminder of paying attention to the relationship to our surroundings in terms of other living organisms, right? And plants and and I love that and that how that kind of naturally transitioned to um, these relational values to one another within our communities, right? And now, of course, talking about um, the, the politics, right, of, of racial injustices, the history behind that, and how do we kind of, how do we engage in that conversation, um, but at the same time, looking at these relational values within our own community. Maybe you can talk a bit more about this kind of this heavy presence and importance of your work inviting people uh that kind of engagement right and and in a way it's not just you and the viewer but it's it's about the work making a pretty intentional relationship with whoever is interacting with the work right uh yeah. what does the process look like for you to develop a project that has it seems like most of your projects have this component this engagement component yeah, there. I mean, I, I mean, I get. I guess it stems from uh, the basic idea that I have a really hard time making anything on my own. <laughs> um, I just like talking, and I like making friends, and I like making friends by making projects. And so, um, I had to. I, I started off as a painter, which was a terrible fit. Um, because you just sit alone in a studio. And then luckily I found printmaking where at least the shop is a communal space, the print shop. And, and luckily I found printmaking at the University of Virginia where Dean Das and Akemi O'Hara and all of the uh, visiting professors that were there, including uh, Allison Melberg Taylor and Ebony Patterson were all sort of interested in uh, uh, building a kind of discourse and a dialogue and a community 
um, more than even making a print. Um, like I definitely learned how to make a print, but I mostly learned how to like talk with other people about ideas and and share resources and figure out um, wh what it looked like to be sort of a citizen of the print shop um, uh, and an engaged presence there. And so that's where it started. And then I feel like one of the things, um, yeah, that's kind of the, the basis of why I make work with other people. And then in terms of it being participatory, I'm just, I think that for me, art is most exciting when, um, I think that the question of participation is one that makes me feel sort of anxious. Like, I'm like, oh, please don't call on me. You know, like, I don't wanna do the thing for your weird art piece when, when I'm in that position. And so I try to find these like vaguely consensual or volunteer ways um, where people can engage with the work on, on their own terms. Uh, uh, but I, I think that that's really important because um, it allows a lot of different voices to be present and a lot of different uh, people to take ownership of a thing. And I think that that's kind of a goal of my practice is to figure out how it's not just my brilliant brain and it's not just my like perfect, beautiful display of skill. It's more about like the kind of weird ecosystem of relationships and questions that come out of multiple people uh, claiming some part of a thing. So. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense, you know, in a way, yeah, it's kind of breaking with this very like orthodox tradition of a painter painting in their studio alone and kind of being this heroic figure coming out with these amazing works afterwards right but i love how you're kind of embracing this this more communal component to your practice like you're embracing it so much to the point where you know the fact that you're living in a you were living in a communal space is an important part of your life and your practice right yeah yeah yeah, I mean, it's, I have just moved in with my partner and it's, I'm 35 going on 36 years old. And I basically have been having a continual uh, like identity crisis around that um, because I love living with people. And I love the, I love coming home to five people I'm not related to who are, who are my family um, and who are all, taking care of a space and figuring out how to navigate boundaries and and mood swings and frustrations and COVID uh, all together. Um, and it's, and yeah, so I'm very excited to live with Ben and I'm now, and I'm, it is a, a really critical part of my life and my work that, that I have kind of prioritized collective living. Yeah, yeah, to follow up with, with you know, how you're engaging with with people who experience your work one of the things that that stuck with me with um our first conversation that we had was this this kind of um this willingness to want to break down what allyship means to you right and in your in your brief talk about your work you kept reminding us like, hey, I'm white. Hey, I'm putting myself in this place and this kind of work in this conversation, but I'm white or these are my ancestors, right? I'm, I'm wondering if we can pick that up again. And I wonder like, how do you see allyship being kind of maybe not the most precise term to use um, with how you see yourself entering these conversations and these kinds of initiatives? Um, maybe you can, talk more about that yeah I don't I don't know I that conversation about allyship as a term is is fraught I think you know I think um allyship somehow uh makes it seem like I am like over on the sideline like helping hold someone up or something and that it doesn't feel quite right I somebody uh once use the word accomplice or something as, as a word. And I like that a little bit better, even though I'm not quite sure it describes the dynamic that I'm aiming for. Um, but I think 
I, I, I think that probably that the, play, the place where I'm most useful in these conversations is probably just supporting the work and the ideas of BIPOC uh, organizers and artists who are already doing the work. And if I've decided that I am, as a white person, as a white anti-racist artist, I'm going to still make work in, in this time, I'm, I'm curious about what it looks like to come from that place genuinely and um, and make work that like uh, actively participates in the dialogue from from my own point of view, um, and so I think that one of the things that has felt most um, uh, exciting to me about that that like difficult impossible space um, is the idea that I am a gardener also, and I'm a queer person, and I'm a person who lives in New York, and I'm a person who moved a lot, uh, around a lot growing up, and I have all of these really specific things that, I, that I'm, that you know, that, uh, that, are, spe that are specific, <laughs> um, that make me who I am, and that those things are kind of interesting things that I bring to the conversation without even meaning to. And so I started thinking about, as a gardener, I started thinking about compost. I started thinking about um, ecological systems. And that to me feels like a really, like using that as a medium or as a way to have a place in these conversations where I don't wanna be the central figure feels like a really like, uh, right now it feels really like an exciting, place of uh, possible. Um, it feels like working with plants allows me to have some of these conversations in a way that isn't like, I'm building a big giant thing. Um, and I, even for this show there, like I said, there are 528 pieces and uh, uh, bricks in this piece and it's huge. And I was definitely like, oh God, this is too big. Here I am just making the giant sculpture. And I was like, yeah, it's true. And I'm asking people to take it apart. So I don't know. So it's just, it's constantly a little bit of like a negotiation. Like I'm never going to be one thing or another. And I hope in the end, it supports a, a general push towards justice and equity. Um, yeah. 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 I think, I mean, regardless right this is um super important work and especially being in the epicenter you now charlottesville has become more of a a, mom, a moment than a place um and i think historically artists have always been um inevitably in charge of questioning and challenging right and i like that kind of that fierceness quality to your work and on that regard um i'm wondering um if if we can touch on other projects, I was actually excited about the my pizza my idea project. Oh yeah, I, yeah, I see that in your background. Yes, is that part yeah, of that? Yeah, yeah. I want to hear more about that. I just launched this mobile cinema project too, about you know, kind of making cinema more accessible, but also celebrating Black and Indigenous filmmakers that are making amazing work. And I saw the mobile pizza. Uh, plays that that you guys had on the bike too so I, yeah maybe you can talk a bit more about that project yeah yeah I mean I think I think in many ways the the mobile cinema cinema project that I I I've now been like following all of your work um, since since we talked and I'm excited about that project and I think that that project and my pizza my idea they both seem to come from a place of being like okay, so there's, there's a thing that we want to share. And that thing um, has the capacity to feel really liberating and really exciting and inspiring. And that thing is also traditionally relegated to a specific place um, or a specific time or a, and, and so both of the projects seek to kind of like push that out a little bit. Um, I feel like with my pizza, my idea, Donna, who's my collaborator on that project, Donna Ablangata, um, I feel like what we were excited about is 
So the idea is that people, or at least for its last iteration, people came into a gallery space. We had a pizza oven set up on the sidewalk. They came into the gallery, they made their pizza. Donna had like studied pizza making and really had like a super uh, specific process. And then they would run it out the door of the gallery because you only have a certain amount of time but to get it off of the, um, oh shoot, now I'm forgetting what it's called, the little, the, the pizza thing. Um, and then uh, we'd put it in the oven and then they would take it out of the oven and then the person wasn't allowed to eat it. They had to give it away. So they would give it to our one of our uniformed cyclists and then they would deliver it anywhere in New York City to anyone that, that anyone. And, and then you show up at some random person's door with a pizza and maybe or maybe not they're, they're expecting it. Um, and I think for us, it was just this project about being like, um, about uh, creating value in a different way than it is created traditionally and about remembering that like the urban fabric of a city is one, um, that is like abundant, there's surprise, the element of surprise in a city is so abundant and really kind of celebrating that as, as these little tiny moments of like potential utopia of like, oh, we're, <laughs> of like, of, oh, we're, we're in, a, in existence in relation to other people and we're, and it's pizza <laughs> and now, other people get pizza. And I think that there's something like funny and silly, but also like uh, pretty profound about um, taking something out of the space where you usually see it and bringing it into, um, a, re reminding each other of a larger context. Yeah, there's definitely that in your work. There's this beautiful kind of celebratory component to it. Um, you know, it's cheerful, it's colorful. Um, and in a way it's, yeah, that makes it so inviting. And in a way it, these also become like anti-capitalist gestures too, right? This kind of uh, invitation to do more communal um, collective kind of activities um, also points to that direction. I think um, with, with a few minutes left, I wanna ask one last question and then I see some some questions coming in from, from folks. Um, moving forward, what are you, yeah, what are you, what are you planning? What are you excited about? I know you just moved to a new place. You're probably still in the process of nesting, uh, but other, maybe other exciting projects coming up? Yeah, I mean, I think I've got a couple little collaborations going on and um, Ben and I bought uh, some acreage up uh, two hours north of New York City. And with a whole growing weird community of extended friends and family and people we um, don't even know and will love and currently love, we're um, figuring out what it looks like to kind of steward that land and, and, and build things on it and um, ha have it be a space that is accessible for people we know and people we don't know and and everyone in between. And so I think um, we have a couple of projects that we're finishing up there. The first, um, well, we have an outhouse that we built um, with a stained glass window and a, and a, a yellow roof. And, um, but we are now building the first like structure that one might sleep in. Um, I mean, I guess you could sleep in the bathroom, but I don't know if it's um, preferable. And so that is one of the big projects. And it's been really cool because uh, a large group of people have come up and learned the skills for traditional timber framing. And um, so we're actually hand chiseling all the joints of this wooden structure um, with a bunch of people, ourselves included, who don't know how to do it. And um, so that's, that's the thing that's kind of like, keeping me going right now. Um, and then I'm working on some new ceramic sculptures with, uh, in collaboration with an amazing uh, uh, figurative ceramicist, uh, Jesse Lee, who has helped me in many projects. Uh, has, 
we've worked together for a long time. So um, yeah, those are the those are the next things I think. Awesome. Yeah, that's pretty ambitious. Starting yeah, kind of building all that infrastructure out there. Um, but it sounds super amazing, super exciting. It it is. It's cool. I mean, it's a it's kind of a nightmare, but it's also cool. <laughs> a, a huge learning process. Yeah, learn as, yeah, yeah. as you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's exciting. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to how that continues to to unfold. Um, we have yeah, Zoe. Have yeah, yeah. We should. We'll do like a new city arts uh, gathering up there. <laughs> right. Um, we have Zoe with some questions here on the chat. Um, Zoe says, as someone who works on the land as well as working as an artist, do you feel like a connection to the land supports a greater sense of connection and empathy to other people as well? Do you feel like you can, you gain a sense of being a part of a larger system through having your hands in the earth? Yes, yes, yes. Zoe, yes. I, I am a person um, who, uh, for many reasons, still has a flip phone and I don't mean to judge anyone who doesn't have, you know, who has smart technology, because I think it is a smart decision in the world that we live in. Um, and, uh, but I, I do feel really scared about how much of our lives are lived on a flat screen. And to me, there's something really, there's some deep connection between the, the cultivation of empathy and spatial relationships, like being able to navigate navigate a conversation with a person, and and see their form in front of you, and like have to have to grapple with that with an actual being. And I feel the same way when I'm working with my hands in the dirt. It's like I'm actually grappling with I'm I'm like having a conversation with something that is heavy and big. Soil is so heavy. It's amazing how heavy it is. Um, and I mean, this piece, I just had no idea what I was getting into. And, and I work with dirt all the time and I still didn't uh, predict it. And I think there's something <clears throat> really amazing about the connections that happen and the empathy that you develop just in like a physical relationship, a proximal relationship to earth and to bodies and to like other organisms that are living. And so I think um, working with the land feels a part, a part of that. Beautifully said. Yeah, I like that. Um, there is something therapeutical about, you know, working with the soil and just kind of re revitalizing that connection, right? Um, yeah. Beautiful. Um, Great, thank you, Zoe, for that question. I don't see other questions. Does anybody else have a question that you haven't put on, on here? Yeah, Kendall, go for it. Kendall has a question. Hey, I'm writing it out, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's taking me a second. You can ask Patrick too. Okay. okay. Um, so hey Patrick, um, okay. hey, um, I would put on my video, but I'm like in my PJs in my bed. <laughs> but, uh, I also I moved around a lot as a. Sorry, what'd you say? Okay, I moved around a lot as a kid, um, and I feel also a strange connection to place and home. And like you mentioned, that Charlottesville is one of the only places that's really been the closest thing to a hometown that you've had. Um, I'm just wondering how that plays into your work more broadly, like home and place. Um, and then also um, for me, working with the land, um, you know, relates to that too. And wondering if that does for you. And uh, yeah, just, just interested in sort of the, um, struggling to find the right word for it but sort of like it's not disconnection but it's you know it's some it feels like a strange relationship to an idea of home that a lot of people have so wondering about that yeah yeah um yeah it is interesting because there isn't a place that I mean I think um there isn't a place that I'm from 
and and that is a or at least I'm sure you know there's a place that my ancestors are from and there's a place but like in my personal life there isn't place uh, a place that I'm from and I think um but I think that the the thing that's interesting about working with the ground is that you have this immediate connection with a physical place and the thing that's interesting about having home be sort of a, a weird idea of something that you just carry on your back with you um your your shell um it, the thing that's interesting about that is that then it becomes about the people in each space or the project you have going on or um uh or like the weird little shrine that you made in your living room uh the like you know like all of these it becomes about objects and it becomes about um experiences and i think that that um fact has factored into my work forever i remember one of the first um one of the first uh projects or one of the first uh articles that was ever written about my work i think was titled costello digs domesticity and i was like yeah <laughs> like i love the idea of like the, a domestic space or a home space um and i and i think that but i think i think of it in a kind of warped way <laughs> that i'm that i think is good this this is um beautiful we just had like a a whole summer here in charlottesville like the three galleries uh including new city arts um visible records and second street moving soil around and it's just been a big kind of uh thing that artists are interested in working with right and you know this question that Candle asked and how you're talking about your connection to land reminds me of the revolution in Mexico and it was led by an indigenous farm worker who who used the phrase that the stewards are the of the land are the ones that work it right are the ones that work with the land and since I arrived since I arrived as a kid um, my community and I have been trying to smuggle seeds and create our own gardens and bring that vegetation into our backyards right and trying to get a better sense of home in a way, right? Through planting, through kind of reclaiming these new territories. Um, but yeah, I wish we we had another session just to talk about this because it's, yeah, yeah. it is fascinating stuff, yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, in relation to the land project that Ben and I are working on in Athens, um, there's another person from Puebla originally here in this conversation and, um, and that person and her community came together and built a sweat lodge on our land. And that was a really interesting like fusion of different uh, practices and different ways of using that space. And that there was, and we've also cultivated this huge meadow with the remnants of the Socrates project and added to that meadow and really tr tried to figure out how to like, um, work with all the different plants that are already there and add all these new ones in. And a lot of the ones we're adding in are ones that were here before like other plants took over. And there's just like an interesting constantly layered um, idea of um, who is, um, when you're working with land and you are a person, I just think that the relationships are kind of never ending and kind of fractal in their um, capacity. Yes, yes. Uh, Zoe just reminded us that another artist in town, um, Isabella Whitfield also has been working with soil and these kind of natural findings. Um, yeah, and she did a, a nice dugout installation at the Kluge Roo Museum here. In, in oh, cool. Toronto. Uh, anybody else have, I think we may have time for one final question for Patrick. Uh, is it okay if I ask one? Please, yeah. yes. Hey, um, thank you so much for this like beautiful, beautiful talk. Um, it was just like a really good way to, to end my day. But um, yeah, I've been a big fan of your theatrical work, Patrick, that you did with Donna for, for a really long time. And uh, yours. 
<laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I mean, gosh, yeah, 10 years ago, I think I think you and Donna were in town when in Michigan and I was I was a very young young artist then and and you gave me an opportunity to to do something before your show. So, thank you. It was uh, so cool. Oh, man, this is so great. Uh, wow, time flies. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to ask um, you know, like like this work at at New City Arts like it is theatrical in a very strong way you know this like active people coming and going and like but I just I just wonder like in your making of sculptural kind of performative work lately like how much does like that experience of like very explicitly theatrical work in the past like inform what you're doing um yeah and also I'm just curious if you uh have any plans or hopes or or do you suppose in the future you might do any more like kind of like explicitly theatrical stuff, you know, where there's like a stage, et cetera. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, uh, first part of your question was, um, how much does theater, like a traditional conception of theater enter into um, this newer sculptural work? And I think um, it's funny because I'm not, God's gift to theater and I'm not God's gift to like performance art or anything, but it is the thing that I love the most because you actually just get to be a body in relation to, to other bodies. And, and like, it is a, it's a medium that, that doesn't happen unless everyone is there making it happen. The audience, the performers, the, the writer, the, the set maker, everyone is, is, um, is uh, critical. And I love that about theater. And so when I'm making sculpture, it's oftentimes just because maybe the collaborators and the people making a big production um, aren't around or like are doing their own project. And then I'm like, well, I guess, I guess I'll like make a sculpture with the few people who are around uh, and then I'll go back and and so I do have plans on making theater uh, or explicitly perform performative work uh, in the future. Um, Donna and I are working on a cranky, like a scroll story scroll thing for um, a cranky festival in Baltimore in January. So that's the next thing um, I'll be drawing or painting or making the scroll and she'll be writing the the kind of text performing and and performing the text that goes with it so yeah there's there's more to come i it, it is the thing i i mean i i hope we can get this pandemic uh under control in a way that allows for a live performance like that to happen more frequently um because uh i miss it we all do. We all do. Yes. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. I look forward to continue to seeing how your work um, evolves and continues to unfold. Likewise, I want I, everyone yeah. check out Federico's new mural and this uh, mobile uh, cinema project because um, it, all of it is so seductive and beautiful and cool. I recommend it. Yes, yes. Uh, Marine, you want to jump into close up? Yeah, uh, Federico, if you want to drop, I put the uh, mobile cinema in the chat, but if you have a link to the mural, if you want to add that as well. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, we want to end on time by 8.30. I have two quick announcements. Um, I, did, I did add a lot of links to the chat and we will post this on our YouTube page next week or the week after, um, which will include all of those links if you want to look up um, a lot of the work that was discussed tonight. Um, the two announcements I have are if you are an artist and you live in the Charlottesville area and you have a project you need $2,500 or $3,000 for, you have an exhibition, um, a tour, you need materials for something you have planned, um, we have a crowdfunded virtual grant event coming up on November 15th. And the application to present is very short, but it is due in three hours um, at 11.59 PM tonight. Um, I am going to put a link in the chat right here. Um, 
we would love um, for you to apply and or send it to an artist you know who should apply. Um, it doesn't have to be like a full-fledged project. It can literally be an upcoming exhibition you need funding to pay for materials for. Um, you would present at the dinner and people would vote to give you the grant, um, to give a person, one of the artists a grant. Um, so it's really fun. You should do it. Yeah, we did this virtually in March and um, each person who comes still only pays $10, but um, you pick up takeout from Pearl Island um, and we're gonna do uh, baker no bakery uh, cookies for dessert. Um, and then you tune in from home. So it's a TV dinner and the artists present. Um, and the other, the other quick announcement I have is that uh, Sandy Williams was in conversation with Lisa Wolfork last week. We will post that um, recording on our YouTube page as well. This Thursday, the third artist in this exhibition, Marisa Williamson, will be in conversation with Tori Cherry um, at 7.30 on Thursday. Um, so the link to that is here um, and you're welcome to sign up. It'll be about the same length. Um, Marisa will talk about um, her work in the show and then Tori will ask her some questions. We'll do some audience Q&A um, as a way to um, hopefully extend the show beyond the gallery walls. So um, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, we'll send out the link to the recording. Thank you, Federico and Patrick, for your time. Um, generous questions and answers this evening. It was really lovely. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Good night, Patrick. Good night, Federico. Good night.